Well, normally I tell you to turn in your Bibles, uh, but uh, this morning's message is a little bit different. It's a little bit more topical. So uh, I'm not going to have you turn anywhere yet, maybe in a little while. Um, so uh, don't let that distract you, though. It's going to be packed full of scripture. Somebody give me the eyes. Terry, give me the eye. Uh-oh, I'm in trouble with my head and my deacon board. <coughs> it will be based on the Bible. <laughs> don't worry. Now, this will probably even be bad once I start with this, Terry. All right. Now, how many of you, and this is, this is really bad because I thought about it this last week. This is almost 30 years ago. And for some of you 30 years ago, this would not have probably even been on your radar then, but it's become kind of a classic movie. How many of you have ever seen the movie Toy Story? Okay, all right. I mean, even today, I mean, that's one you show your kids, okay? Uh, do you remember? So this is, this is the first Toy Story, okay? There's been three others since then, all right? Do you remember when Buzz and Woody are trying to get back to Andy uh, in the moving truck. And all the other toys in that truck, they, they, they still, they're mad at Woody because they think that he is trying to get rid of Buzz. Remember that? Okay. Well, at one point in the moving truck scene, all the other toys realize that they actually are wrong, that Woody was not trying to get rid of Buzz. He was trying to save Buzz. And they had accused Woody falsely of doing wrong. And Rex the dinosaur, who's a very sensitive T-Rex, in one of the scenes he cries out, Oh, now I have guilt! You picture that? Stand that? Okay. Now I have guilt. You know, I, I think that attitude, I think that describes many believers. We personally struggle to believe and to accept God's forgiveness of our sin. We looked at that last Sunday, right? We looked at what is the biblical basis for the forgiveness of our sin. It is the work of Jesus Christ. But we still feel guilty over the sins we've committed in our lives. And sometimes we may actually maintain those guilty feelings because we think that if we don't feel bad, we actually aren't taking sin seriously enough. Ever met anybody like that? Ever experienced that yourself? I need to feel bad about this so I can prove to God I really am sorry. And it's usually something in our mind that we have said, Oh, this was a really bad thing that I did. It's not every sin. It's usually just something that we would consider this was really bad, and i got to feel bad about it so I can prove to God I really mean business. But more than that, that's just one instance. We all know that we have sinned. And we all know we still sin on a daily basis often. And so... We struggle with this idea of God's forgiveness. Well, guilt is at the heart of understanding forgiveness. What should we do with our guilt, specifically our guilty feelings? And what is God's answer to a guilty conscience? And there are two main reasons I think believers struggle with guilt and God's forgiveness and accepting God's forgiveness. Uh, the first one is very simple. We don't have a scriptural understanding of guilt. We have more a worldview of the world's view of understanding of guilt, not what God says about it. And so we have to look at, well, why do I feel guilty? And that's usually what goes along with that. It has to do with our feelings, doesn't it? I feel this way about this thing. Should I feel guilty about this? Who determines the guilt? And who decides if that guilt has been dealt with properly? The second thing is this. We have a, an unbiblical understanding, I think, of forgiveness. 
That's one reason we're doing this series right now. We want to look at what does God say about this very important topic of forgiveness, both vertically and horizontally when we get there. Because as we said last week, you have to understand this direction so you can better apply this direction. And last week we clearly saw that for all those who have truly trusted Jesus Christ alone as their Savior, God says in Colossians chapter 2, He has forgiven all our sins. What we need to start doing is applying God's forgiveness actually to our lives and come to a fuller understanding of how God wants us to deal with our sin on a daily basis. But here's the problem for many. I've found for myself even. I don't base my application of God's forgiveness on His truth. I do just base it on how I feel at the time. I feel guilty. I feel bad. So that must be what is true. I base things on my feelings instead of on faith. In God and His Word. I based it on my opinions of how I think it works. Or maybe on some watered-down cliche I've heard in the Christian faith. Because that happens often as well. And so my hope today is to begin to deepen our understanding of these areas and how they relate to one another. And we'll see how far we get here. This this message, I'll be honest with you, is packed full of lots of stuff. And I want to take my time and I want to make sure I am clear. That's been my prayer all week. Lord, let me be clear. Okay? So we'll see how far we get here. So hang with me. All right? When we are guilty of sin, how do we deal with it in God's way? So let's, first of all, let's answer this question. What is guilt, and why is it important for us to understand this? Now, how does God define guilt? Because we have to answer to him ultimately, so it doesn't matter how we define it. It doesn't matter how others define it. How does God define it? Well, guilt is primarily a legal or a judicial term that applies to a criminal responsibility in the eyes of a court of law, right? I mean, we use this all the time. You are innocent until proven what? Guilty. You want to hear that verdict in the court? We find a defendant innocent or guilty. So it has to do with that, whether it's a human court or it's a divine court. And so guilt is really liability to punishment for wrongdoing. And it assumes a standard has been violated. A law has been broken. And last week, we discussed the fact that we have all violated God's law, God's standard, and so we are guilty in that sense. Everyone, as we read from Romans 3 this morning, everyone is guilty, right? All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, which is God's perfect standard. And he tells us that that's the law. We've all violated that. So here's, I hope, a more practical definition of guilt, both, of, of, both personally uh, and, if you would, uh, generically or broadly. Guilt acknowledges our responsibility and accountability for our attitudes and actions which have offended or harmed our relationship with God and others because of sin. That's it. And there's some key words there. First of all, it acknowledges. This is, not, this is so much more than just like, yeah, 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 I did something wrong. This is, no, I'm taking ownership of what I did wrong. I'm acknowledging, confessing that I am responsible and I'm also accountable for my attitude and my actions. Can I give you a little tidbit here? A little, a little, uh, just uh, practical advice that will help you a lot. 
you are responsible only for your attitudes and your actions. My kids will be able to tell you that all the time, right? They've heard that multiple times. You're not responsible for your sister's or your brother's attitude and action. You're responsible for yours. You must take responsibility for it, right? And when we have done wrong, we have offended or we have harmed either our relationship with the Lord or our relationship with others because we have sinned against them. In fact, this is what David has done in Psalm 51. If you want to turn to Psalm 51, let's do that so we can get you actually in the Bible. I don't want to get fired this morning. Psalm 51. This is what David has done here. We won't read the whole thing, but we'll read the, at least the, the, the verses 1 through 6. This is David's confession, response. And you have to read the little note there at the very beginning. That's actually part of Scripture. It says, To the choir master, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. So he has committed adultery. Most of you know that story. You know what David had done. Here's what David responds with. He says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Did you notice that theme of my, my, my? For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. So David is doing this right here. He's acknowledging finally. Now it took him over a year to do that. He tried to hide it. He tried to pretend it didn't exist. But then Nathan the prophet confronted him. He finally confessed that guilt. Now why is this important for us to do as believers? Well, first of all, why are we even studying this this morning? Well, because the world wants to avoid and wants to minimize guilt, doesn't it? That's the world's approach to this. I mean, think about this. What we are actually talking about this morning, we're talking about guilt and sin. The world would not say, hey, sign me up for that one. I'm so glad I've come to church this morning, especially in our Western culture. We, we don't discuss these things. And primarily because, here's the thing, we associate this stuff with bad feelings. And our culture has gone to the place where if anything makes me feel bad, I avoid it, I run from it, I hide it all the time. I don't want to deal with it. I don't want to talk about those bad feelings. I just want those bad feelings to go away. Well, that leads us to the second thing. The problem is if we don't handle guilt rightly, it is going to distort other problems in our life. Why are people so miserable? And most people are. If you really ask them, they're miserable with their life. They're always looking for something. Primarily because they haven't come to the understanding of the gospel, but because they haven't learned how God has wants to deal with and give forgiveness to them and deal with their guilt. And because God has built this into us, we all have a conscience. He has written his law on our hearts. People know, even if they suppress it, even if they got to the point where they've hardened their hearts toward what God says, they know what is basically right and what is wrong because God has made it so. As we saw in Romans 3, we are accountable and so people are miserable because they're running from God. And they're trying to hide their guilt. They won't own up to the problem. And here's the thing. Sin complicates things. And if we refuse to deal with guilt biblically, it complicates other areas of our life. That's why we talked about last week where John MacArthur said that, you know, 
he has found that so many other problems in the counseling room would be solved if people would actually understood God's forgiveness and how they are to forgive others. Because they're walking around with this weight on them that they don't even realize. The third thing is this. We need to study this because our view of guilt determines our response when we are confronted by others. Now, this is important, especially as Christians, as those who have actually confessed their sin, who have said, I am guilty. That's what you did when you believed the gospel, right? You said, Jesus died in my place for my sin. I am guilty. I deserve to be punished for what I have done. I have earned that. But God in Christ has set me free. And so if we as Christians, if we don't understand this and we don't actually embrace the gospel in this way, it's going to impact us and hurt us. And a wrong understanding leads to really one of, I think, three main responses. We either excuse our sin, we try to hide it, we try to justify our sin, we try to cover it up, or we try to blame shift and throw it onto somebody else. Those are the three main ways that we try to unbiblically deal with sin. And here's the thing, we come by it naturally. It's how we have always dealt with guilt from the very beginning in Genesis 3. That's what Adam and Eve did, right? When God came and confronted them about their sin, what did they do? They did that. One, they hid, right? When God's come walking to the cool of the garden, what do they do? They, they try to cover themselves up with fig leaves because they realize in their sinfulness they were naked now. And so then they hide from God. And God's like, why are you hiding from me? You've never done that before. What has changed? And he asks all these open-ended questions, right? He knew the answer, but he wants them to come clean. And yet they hide from him, they cover up their sin, and then they start pointing the finger. Adam says, the woman you gave me, God, he, she did it. The woman says, what, the serpent, he deceived me and I ate. The serpent, you know, he didn't have a leg to stand on, so come on, come on. Those are, those are jokes here, people. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Nothing has changed since Adam and Eve. The same answers are given today to deal with guilt. But the problem is the world's answers only deals with the effects. It only deals with the feelings of guilt, not the underlying reasons for it. The world doesn't recognize ultimately that sin and an offended God are the cause of our guilt. And so they won't come clean with God. They won't acknowledge that they are accountable to Him for their attitudes and their actions. However, there's great hope. We don't have to stay there. That's the good news. If, if that's all we had to present, yeah, man, we would be in big trouble, but we don't. We have answers. We have hope. And God has done that for us. But guilt, we need to stop seeing it if it's a true guilt. And maybe next week we'll look at more or less. Some, there is some false guilt that is dealt with in our lives, and Scripture deals with that. But true guilt, here's the thing. God has designed guilt for a reason. It's God's idea, by the way. And it can be a positive friend if it leads us toward Christ and Christ-likeness. I love what John Stott says on this. He says, A guilty conscience is a great blessing, but only if it drives us to come home. Otherwise, it's not a great blessing. And that's usually how we deal with these things. When we feel convicted, when we feel guilty because we've done something wrong, we really have two choices. We can either run to God or we can run from God. But the gospel has made a fundamental shift and change to say, run to me. Don't run from me. Satan says, run from God. That's his answer. When I have messed up, he says, run away. Get far away. 
And if I even try to come close to God, he, you know what he whispers to me? You hypocrite. Why would God accept you? Because, Right? Is that his lie? You've sinned, run from God. I heard one pastor describe it this way. It's kind of, we have a hockey mentality, a penalty box mentality when it comes to our sin. Like, well, you, you need to be put in the penalty box for two minutes. You need that time out. Well, somebody else put it this way. Here's the fundamental change for the Christian. When we have actually sinned, before Christ, here's what we said. Oh, no, I've sinned. I hope my dad doesn't find out. You ever had that when you were growing up? Well, the last thing in the world is you wanted your parents to find out how bad you messed up? Man, I hope mom and dad don't find out about this. But you know the gospel changes that? When I actually sin, what God says he wants us to do now is, oh, man, I sinned. I need to go tell my dad. Why? Because my dad understands. My dad's going to come to me, and yes, will he confront me like he did Adam and Eve? Yes. But will he apply his grace? Yes. Always. See, the world says it's not your fault. Don't feel guilty. The world wants to blame it on everything else, right? Well, it's your environment. It's your upbringing. Blame your parents. Blame your circumstances. Blame anything other than your attitudes and your actions. It's interesting. Adam and Eve, if it, it was truly our environment, it was other outso outside things, Adam and Eve has no excuse then, do they? What kind of environment did they live in? Hmm. They're in a perfect environment. It wasn't their environment that caused them to sin. It wasn't because God didn't provide for them. See, the world says to us, no, it's all those things, or your conscience, it's just too sensitive. It's not that big of a deal. Or now it's just, well, there's no truth. You make up your own truth. There's no such thing as sin. There's no accountability. You do whatever makes you happy. Set your own standards of right and wrong. And if you feel bad about something and you really want to do it, then keep doing it until you don't feel bad about it anymore. That's their response. The world's answer simply is Genesis chapter 3. But the real problem, the unresolved guilt... The unconfessed sin actually comes with a price tag, especially for the Christian, but definitely for the unbeliever as well. Psalm 32, Psalm 38, two other great psalms I encourage you to look up, plainly states that not dealing with guilt actually has physical and emotional consequences. David there is, again, account, is is recalling the things that he had done wrong. I think one of them, again, it's what he had done wrong with Bathsheba and that whole year of not confessing his sin. At Psalm 38, he goes into all the ways that that guilt of that sin was physically impacting him, making him sick. So yes, there is oftentimes a physical correlation to spiritual things. It does impact us. It does have consequences. But we have hope in the gospel. God has answers for us. As we saw in Psalm 51, when he confessed his sin, he was released from that guilt. That's what God wants us to do. We're going to stop there this morning. We've laid that groundwork. And we'll, we'll look at some more things next week, but uh, I don't want our time to get away. I don't want to have to rush through the next section because we're going to look at what is forgiveness in more detail. From God's perspective, and he deals with our sin, how does he forgive us both as a judge, I'll give you a little insight, and as a parent? 
there's basically two types of forgiveness taught in the scriptures. Two aspects, if you would, of forgiveness. And God wants us to understand what that looks like and how that sets us free. But the good news that I want to give you this morning is that if you have put your faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are not guilty. Not because of what you have done as we've sung. Not because you've earned it or you, it's because of what Christ has done. He has exchanged and given you his perfect righteousness on your account. He's taken your sin debt on himself. In fact, let, let's close with one scripture. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I don't want you to just believe my word for it. I want you to believe God's word. One very simple verse. Well, let's start at verse 19. But verse 21, you guys probably, many of you know it well, but it's so good. Verse 19 says this, that in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Did you notice that verse 19? What does he not count against the world? Their sins, right? Their trespasses. And you think, wait a minute, how is that so? But aren't they guilty? Don't people die separated from Christ and, and they go to hell? Yes, they do. How is that so? If, if he doesn't count them because they haven't come in God's way to God's son. Again, it's not automatic. The work has been done already. The price has been paid. That's why he says, I'm not going to count it against them anymore because Jesus Christ paid that penalty. But they have not accepted that payment on their behalf. <coughs> and so he says, he does not count it against us. And he's trusted us with this message to go to people. Verse 20, therefore we are our ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. God has broke down this barrier, this wall. You can be reconciled to God. This thing that separates you has been taken care of in Christ. And then verse 21 is one of the grandest verses in Scripture. For our sake, for our sake, he, that is God, made him, that is Jesus, to be sin for us who knew no sin, so that in Jesus we might become what? The righteousness of God. It's really the great exchange of the gospel. We had this sin debt we could not pay for. Jesus took it on himself. And in return, he said, here, I'm going to give you my righteousness. It's a, as we saw last week, it's a banking terminology. It is finished. The debt has been paid in full. You don't owe Jesus anymore. And it's as simple as that. And what's complicated, sometimes we want to make it. It's as simple as that. If you get a speeding ticket and you're guilty of speeding and you know it, and he has you dead to rights, you're going 65 and a 55. Or you were going 50 and a 35, whatever it is. But then I come along and I say, well, I'll pay your speeding ticket. It's already done. How much do you owe then on that speeding ticket? None. That's what he's saying. It's as simple as that. You have a, you have a sin debt. You owe God. You, you're guilty of it. But Jesus has come along and he said, hey, I'm going to pay that for you. My death, I'll take your place. But then, what does this verse say? That we might become what? The righteousness of God. So not only does he clear your, your debt, but then he gives you into your bank account his own righteousness. I'm going to put money in there for you. And so when God looks at the books and the records, and he says, well, the, no, the debt's been paid. And look, oh, you're to the good. Man, look at all that money. Look at that righteousness that Jesus has given you. Because he was perfect. He obeyed me perfectly. And so now he says, I'm going to take their place. That's the gospel. That's what Jesus has done for us. That's why he can say, you're forgiven. You're free. But it's only when you put your faith in him. 
What a wonderful thing we have to share with the world. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for these wonderful truths. And Lord, I know we didn't get through all the, the things I wanted to get through today, but uh, Father, I pray that you would help us to just continue to work these things out. Uh, Lord, uh, to apply forgiveness to our lives. Uh, forgiveness should bring about a change. It should bring about a freedom to say, man, I, look at what all God has done for me. I want to live for him who died for me. So, Lord, I pray that you would help us to continue to do that and to remember that before your throne, we have a strong and perfect plea. Lord, thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.